So uh, I'm Alan Hytella, and uh, I'm the uh, front-end lead at Ecobee. Uh, we make internet-connected thermostats, and uh, right now we currently have about six mobile apps, uh, three web portals, all powered by Angular 1. And um, as we're planning to move our applications forward, we need to start looking at how do we take what we have today and ensure that it's not going to be continuing to accrue additional technical debt as we, as we move forward. Um, so what we started to do was to move about you know, 75,000 lines of code from uh, ES5 over to ES2015 using uh, Webpack uh, Babel uh, combination in order to achieve that. Um, you know, some may be wondering why we don't actually have decided to move to Angular 2 or React or one of these other platforms is <clears throat> right now we have a code base that works. Um, we're not about to go in and break something that's doing really, really good things for us just for the sake of moving on to what is necessarily next. We want to make strategic decisions. So what ES2015 will let us do is all of these next, um, whether it be frameworks, whether it be, um, whether it be libraries that are coming up, they're all going to be based around ES2015. And we want to make sure that our current code base will be in a good spot for us to leverage those technologies when we find something that will help us propel us to the next level uh, against our competitors or um, when we're building something net new. So we're really about, we really want to create additional options for ourselves. You know, what do we move to? Is it Angular 2, TypeScript, Redux, React? There's all kinds of really, really awesome stuff out there, and I recommend everybody look at all of those things very, very carefully because they're, they are great, great um, accelerators of your applications of, in terms of being able to get code out the door, uh, reduce errors, and all that good stuff that goes along with um, the newer, better, bigger frameworks. So uh, also more and more tools are going to continue to be written in ES 2015 and 2016. So we want to be able to leverage them. And as time goes on, the majority of them will be written that way, and ES5 will slowly become more and more and more deprecated. And we don't want to get stuck in that other camp of having a bunch of ES5 code that now we're in, under, in a pinch to try and bring up to uh, ES 2015. So we're being proactive. We want to start taking advantage of ES 2015 features now, um, have, have those features accelerate our development and put us in a good position to make good decisions down the line. So <clears throat> what we're using uh, is Babel. This is uh, for, I'm not sure how many people are, are already writing uh, ES 2015, um, whether it be with Webpack or whether you're using Gulp or Grunt. But this is the, the main tool that we end up using to transpile our ES2015 code into ES5 so that all the browsers can understand it. This means that I don't have to go to can I use and look up arrow functions and say, well, you know what, Safari isn't supporting this particular feature set that I'm using in my code yet. Uh, I don't have to worry about it now. Once everything catches up, I can actually then remove Babel and I don't have to transpile from ES2015 over to es or ES5. Uh, same way with CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript was doing the same thing. You would write in CoffeeScript, it spits out ES5 on the other side, you load it in your browser, and uh, you gain productivity because you're writing in a, at a higher level of abstraction. So why do we want ES2015? Well, there's a whole bunch of great advantages. Um, one being you get block scoping with your variables, so there's no more, you know, your variable defined outside of an if statement exists throughout the entire application uh, or that entire that entire block. Um, you get lexically scoped error functions. So this within that error function actually refers to its its parent uh, its parent block, which is really nice. No more hacky solutions with this equals that or having to use function apply or any of those workarounds to be able to refer to this within that method body. Um, you get the spread operator, which is technically ES 2016, but it's really great, especially if you're doing more functional work. And uh, generators, destructuring of variables, There's all, the list goes on and on and on. These are all things that, regardless of what platform you're on, you can start taking advantage of uh, to write better code, cleaner code, um, easier to understand code. And this will work with Angular 1, it'll work with um, any JavaScript platform that you have today, you can start to port over to it and take advantage of, the, of those features. Um, one thing that 
Babel doesn't do, though, is uh, have inherent support for the module system within ES2016. So this is where you're able to import files into other files. Um, and this is a huge advantage be because I'm not sure if anybody has worked with something like Require.js or one of the other module systems. These were all built on ES5 um, and as a way of, of patching in the ability to create these modules and require them within different files. Um, ES2015 now has this natively as a language feature. So we want to be able to take advantage of this because this will become the standard moving forward. Um, and we want to make sure that our, our code is going to be aligned with that standard so that now, now we can start to import all of these great libraries that may be coming later down the, down the line. Um, so we can't use Require.js, so what are we going to use? We need, a, we need a different system in order to support that. And this is where a Webpack comes in. Uh, so it understands everything, which is really great. Right now, there's a couple of different formats for uh, modules. One is CommonJS, so you have AMD, uh, but Webpack can understand it all. So if I, within my JavaScript file, want to import a CommonJS uh, library, I can, and start using it. If I want to import something that's been AMD wrapped, I can, and start using it. It understands all of it um, and will build my bundle accordingly. Uh, and it does this you, through this idea of loaders. It'll look at a file and say, okay, I, I see this file type. I know what to do with it. Um, and Webpack can also provide loaders for many different file types. So now we can talk about bringing in other things, whether it be CSS, SCSS, um, images, you name it. There are loaders that are able to actually pack much more than JavaScript. And I'll get to that a little bit later. But... What I want to, to talk about is that process of taking that Angular 1 app that isn't written in ES6, maybe, or ES2015, is written in ES5, and how do we bring it over into that ES2015 framework? Um, so this might be an app that you might have built using, say, a, a Yeoman generator, generator Angular, one of those, uh, one of those ways of getting an app off the ground, and you might have a few different files that all get concatenated together and then delivered to the client. Or you end up require, you know, not requiring them, but um, importing them all into your main index.html. They all end up getting loaded. Uh, this is the, how a lot of us have been writing these apps. Um, as more task runners have become more prevalent, whether it be Grunt or, uh, or Gulp, and we start to see more complicated tasks built around bringing all of these files together, concatenating, minifying, uh, whether it be Uglify, uh, all, of these, all of these build tasks to make a nice tight bundle and sent down to the, that you send down to the client. Um, so, so that's typically what we've done before. And, and hopefully this looks somewhat familiar to those that have, engaged, you know, have written some Angular apps before. And um, one interesting thing is that not all of the systems that we end up seeing trying to solve the uh, bundling problem do it particularly well. And, and here's something that uh, has been really interesting on iTunes Connect. I don't know if anybody's ever been to their website, but um, if you look down here, we've got 107 requests going on. This is live today. This takes 11 seconds to load. Um, and each one of these files has is basically the raw source. There's comments. It's 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 a it's an utter disaster. Every single one of these files is loaded by require.js. This is this is web development done absolutely the wrong way. And I guess I I don't know why Apple hasn't fixed this. It's been live for months. Um, maybe they don't care. And that's that's kind of what I what what I'm leaning towards. But um, we want to avoid doing this type of thing. Uh, wrapping everything in require.js. And, and Webpack, fortunately, out of the box, as a default, will give you one file, which is a heck of a lot better than 107. So, um, you, you know, you have to be careful when you're using these tools, and that's, that's really what I want to say here, is that, you know, it, if you don't know what you're doing with require.js, you could end up in this total mess. And some really big companies are ending up with this type of situation, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. So um, how do we 
start to use modules within ES2016 using Webpack. Well, uh, Webpack needs a way to know where to start to analyze all of those imports, all of that dependency tree. So you give it an entry point. And for our Angular app, that's going to be our app.js file. Um, that's usually where you might have a bunch of routing defined. You'll, uh, you'll be calling out all of your controllers, your directives, all of those um, maybe within there. Or you may, if you are using Grunt or Gulp or uh, one of something to concatenate all those files, you may have those, those directives actually defined within separate files. So it might look like angular.directive and then a function that defines the directive, angular.service defines a service, and all of that gets concatenated and, and uh, served down to the client. With Webpack, we're going to approach things a little bit differently. We're going to tell it the one place where it should start looking, and it's actually going to spider through all of the imports and say, well, okay, I need this file now. Let's bring it into the package. Let's, oh, I now need this file because it's being required or imported, um, bring it into the package. This has a couple of advantages. Uh, one being that if you have files that you haven't actually imported, you're, they're not going to end up in your final package um, rather than doing something like concatenate, you know, star from all directories and just, uh, you know, this is now my bundle. Um, as your code base grows, that approach, you often end up with, you know, you go through a couple of refactorings and you might end up with this dead weight that just gets bundled and sent to your client needlessly. Um, and unless you're doing some kind of static analysis, you won't be able to catch it. Um, Webpack will catch that and won't even include it in the final bundle. So that's a, that's a nice advantage right out of the box. So what does that top level app.js file look like when we've converted it over to ES2015 with uh, their import system? Um, so again, what we've done is we've actually broken out all of the um, controller logic, configuration logic, directive logic into separate files. And we're just going to require those files. Um, but you'll notice that oftentimes in uh, an Angular 1 ES5 app, the, the angular.controller might live in a separate file. We're not going to build this up in the top-level app.js like this. Um, and this, this particular method has some advantages because now what's going to happen is in those sub-controllers uh, directives, now we're just going to be writing pure JavaScript functions as opposed to wrapping them in angular.directive, angular.service. And... For us, as we're moving forward, we're evaluating other platforms, other ways of uh, making our application better, faster, stronger. Having less code that is one framework specific makes it easier for us to reason about other frameworks and, and potentially migrate one way versus the other. So that might be Angular 2, that might be Redux, that might be React, that might be something that comes out tomorrow that we are really that becomes really really exciting we don't know but we want to set ourselves up for that and put our best foot forward so you'll see these imports and you might be wondering well where does angular and angular root that are being imported where are those actually coming from um because there's we're, we're just defining a file now uh where they actually do come from is now we're actually require we're actually using npm to package these um, so we're pulling them in. We're actually using a real dependency tool. Um, Bower doesn't really do a whole lot of dependency management. It won't um, handle nested dependencies. There's a whole lot of reasons why Bower is not a really good tool to be using. Um, so we can get out of it. Also, we, now we can use one dependency management tool to require all of our, bring in all of our external dependencies. So we're essentially calling npm save Angular, npm save uh, Angular root, and then those become available uh, within Webpack. Webpack knows that, hey, I have these, these node modules available, and I can now bring them in to my final bundle. Um, so this is a little bit different. Now we're, now we're actually building the final package in node and then delivering it out the other side. But now we can stop using things like Bower um, and have a single source for, of our dependency management. So our login controller, as I was saying before, now looks like this. It's just a, a straight JavaScript function. And uh, you might notice an ng inject at the top. Um, this is because I want to use the, the compact form for Angular's injection. Uh, I want to have Webpack go in afterwards and uh, put all the inject 
statements for me. I don't want to have to do it myself. Uh, and Webpack has this concept of loaders, so it will see these these files and look for that particular comment and say, okay, I know what to do. I should add these additional injects so that uh, Angular's dependency injection continues to work should I want to minify my files. Now, this is this is completely optional. If you don't want to minify an, or uglify um, your files, it, it's you, you don't have to do it, but we would like to deliver as small a package down to our client as possible for various reasons, speed of loading your application being the main one. Um, so these directives, controllers, and services, now they just become plain JavaScript functions. So uh, again, it's easier to move around. The portability is, is much, much greater. Um, so moving on, what we need to do now to actually get Babel uh, and Webpack to work, or we'll probably need to install some other stuff. Um, so right now, we need Babel loader, uh, a Babel preset, which will tell Babel, which is our transpiler, how to move our ES2015 code into ES5. Um, how that works is there are various levels of things that it can do. And if you go to the Babel website, you'll see um, they will have the basic package, which will give you a certain number of features that it knows how to transpile. And then there are additional uh, options that you can provide that will give you more and more and more advanced features as you declare that you want to use them. So that's what we're bringing in. We're bringing in uh, the basic preset for Babel and then preset stage zero, which is basically give me all of the things um, because there's some really nice stuff in there. Uh, finally, we also want to bring in Webpack. Uh, having it installed globally is useful. You can then run, call Webpack from your project and it will spit out your bundle on the other side and you can use it in your, in your, uh, in your application as you need. So a bunch of boilerplate in case anybody wants to, I'm going to put these slides up afterwards in case anybody wants to go and look at the boilerplate for Webpack and how this particular, um, how the configuration looks. It's here, it's available. Um, this is the sim very similar to some of the generators that are out there. So if you want to grab a, uh, you know, a, an Angular, uh, Angular 1 ES2015 Webpack Babel uh, generator, they, they exist and it will give you a good leg up if you want to create a new project, but should you want to look at it, it's right here um, for setting up the boilerplate. But essentially what we're doing is we're providing the bundle name that we want to have created. We are telling it where we want to go. We, we want to say that we want to have source maps generated and we define some loaders, which uh, look at a particular file and say, when I see a file of type JavaScript, I want to do this to it. And in this case, under loaders, we want to run Babel. So we run Babel, it transpiles it into ES5, spits it out the other side, and now I can use it in a, any, any web browser that understands ES5. Um, and my application is just going to continue going along. At the bottom, we're using ng-annotate and uh, uglify uh, to make sure that our package is as small as possible that we deliver to the client. Uh, but those are, again, those plugins are entirely optional you don't absolutely, they're not required to get things up and running and if you just want to play around. So again, running Webpack, very simple. We call Webpack, it'll spit out your ES6 module. Um, it, with the previous uh, config, it'll be at your distribution bundle name.js. Again, you get your source maps um, so that your mangled uh, minified JavaScript is actually debuggable in your browser. And uh, it... Webpack, fortunately, also makes it really easy to tie into whatever your task runner of the day might be. So whether it be, you know, Grunt, you can you can tie Webpack into it. Um, you can tie it into Gulp. And the nice thing about Webpack is you don't necessarily, for a lot of um, fairly straightforward applications, you don't even need them anymore. Uh, the, the loaders and plug-in system will cover 99% of what you need to do, that, what you would normally be doing with either um, Grunt or Gulp, which is nice. Um, Another useful tool is Webpack Dev Server. This is, a, again, equivalent to both in Grunt or Babel, or sorry, uh, Grunt or uh, a Gulp, the, um, the servers that are available there that will bring up your application and let you live reload and debug and do all of those nice things when you save files, uh, hot reload and that kind of thing. Uh, but basically, you just point run the Webpack Dev Server in the root of your application as long as you have an index.js that references the packed file that you want that you're generating it will bring up a web server uh, running at at the specified port and you're able to live de you know, basically debug and build as you would go with uh, live reloading and all that good stuff um, so now we've 
done some real, so, you know, we've got a basic application set up. It, it's being served by, by Webpack and uh, we're using ES2015. We can start to do some interesting stuff because Webpack lets you import, well, pretty much anything. So we can start to import style sheets into our, into our files. And this has a bunch of advantages. Um, right now you'll see uh, within this template, I'm not sure if uh, it's big enough, but um, I'm importing two SCSS files. And then within those SCSS files, I have the same rule declared, main color. But because within my Angular template, uh, I'm referencing color one dot uh, main color, I'm actually going to get a rule that will give me blue. And similarly for color two, I'm going to get a rule that gives me red. And, and, and what's happened to the cascade in this, at this point? Like, wh how, is this, how is Webpack actually letting me define two CSS rules that are the same, but have a different result within the actual application when I load it up? Well, what Webpack is doing is it's actually prefixing all of these CSS rules that it's generating. Um, because everything within Webpack is an actual module. And we really don't want to have modules to be able to conflict with each other within a modular system. So Webpack handles this for us, which is re a really, really nice feature. So now I, if I have module A and module B and I want to, them to exist within the same page, and each of those modules are requiring their own CSS, I don't have to worry that module A's CSS is going to conflict with module B's um, if I am, when I'm using Webpack, which is really convenient. And Webpack just makes it so that the cascade won't affect each other. It will prefix these class names and then in the generated CSS also modify the class names. So cascade conflicts between modules, just they just go away. Um, the nice part about that now is you also get to see your CSS dependencies in your code. So you're not relying on uh, a developer knowing that now I have CSS from maybe main.css or scss or I have uh, rules coming from a particular override file or this other place. Uh, I don't have to remember that as a developer or bring up my dev tools and then look at the, look at the, the source and see, oh, okay, yeah, you, here's this where this rule's being defined. Or if I forgot to turn on source maps or I'm using a third-party um, third CSS, I don't have to worry about it anymore. In my actual file now, in my JavaScript file, that is rendering out template code, I can actually see what CSS is actually going to be, that, that that file is actually responsible for. So now, if I give this off to another developer, they know exactly where to go to start modifying, changing CSS. They're not gonna go in and without having a full picture of your, of your, your style system, um, go in and make something that maybe cascades the wrong way throughout your application. They can go in and just modify that one particular place of CSS, which is really, really convenient. So, and basically also another advantage of Webpack is that when it ends up walking this dependency tree, as it's going through, it'll look at, you know, your styles that have been imported, it'll look at your JavaScript that's been imported, and um, it will ignore those parts that you're not using. Um, so if you don't import something, those files won't get imported. A nice feature of Webpack 2 that's currently in beta is a feature called tree shaking, which will actually analyze those imports and say, you are not actually even using this anywhere, and I'm not even going to include it. So you may have this application where you have four, five, six imports. Um, you did some refactoring. You left the import there. Uh, Normally what would happen is that all that stuff would get bundled and packaged and sent down to the client and you sent maybe you know, 10, 10, 12 extra bytes that you didn't need to. Webpack 2 uh, will actually analyze those dependencies because now we have a dependency tree that it can go through and say, oh, you know what, I'm not using this guy. Get it out of here. I'm not using this CSS rule. Get it out of here. And we'll make sure that your final deliverable that you end up sending down to your client is as small and compact as possible. Um, so this is a really, really going to be a really, really nice feature once this comes out. It's in beta. It's, it's usable now. It, it works really nicely. Um, and it's also a feature that's available in another uh, bundler called Rollup. Uh, this is, it, that's available now too. So they, they're both two ways of supporting this notion of tree shaking. And uh, this is something that we'll be 
available with Webpack 2 when it comes out. So um, I just want to open it up um, to any questions at this point about uh, whether it be Babel, whether it be how we're moving our apps from uh, ES5 to ES2015, um, or how Webpack works and how all this bundling stuff happens. Yeah. So the answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> and if you ha you you're saying you have multiple versions of jQuery, yeah. right? Like say I have like you know two point one and I have two point three as as requirements. Um, so what will happen is first and foremost, if you're using npm, it will try and resolve those as cleanly as possible. So it will try and find a common ground that is acceptable to all of your package.json files. So that's the first place where you'll, you'll hopefully get alignment so that you're really only needing to import one of them. If that happens to be the case that I really have a package that really needs like jQuery 1 and, a, and one that really needs jQuery 2, well, you are going to get both of those. Um, th those are going to both have to be brought in and you're going to have to uh, define an alias for one of them. So, uh, and this, this is no different than any other application where you need two versions of the same library to be loaded in the client. Hopefully you, you can avoid that situation by either upgrading one, but um, you're not necessarily going to avoid it if there is actually a dependency required for two versions of the same library at the different, for, like two different versions of the same library. So just be mindful of what Yeah, be mindful. Um, typically, you might, you, when you install stuff by NPM, it will give you a, it will tell you if you have a version conflict and it'll say, well, this, this bundle, this package.json is requiring version X and this is requiring version Y. Um, what do you want to do? Because I can't resolve this. It'll ask you to resolve it manually. And typically you'll see that pop up. And if it does, it means that I, you, should, you should tread carefully. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? That's true. Yeah, so, so um, that's a very good question, is if you're using stage zero. So stage zero is essentially edge, uh, is, is the equivalent of edge for, for Babel. It is stuff that is being used fairly heavily, or, or it, it, some of the features are being used fairly heavily, uh, especially in the React community, a spread being the most obvious, uh, obvious one. If anybody's been writing anything with React, um, spread is used all over the place. Uh, similarly with Redux, if you've been looking at Redux, it's a, it's a very heavily used feature. Um, the answer is, I think, you need to be careful about which features you're using. Um, I'm mainly including it for spread. Uh, and there's a, there's a large, a large amount of code out there that is currently leveraging it. Um, so if something is in stage zero versus say stage four, which is pretty much ratified at this point, I would, I would take it with a grain of salt and, and really evaluate if you absolutely, absolutely have, really need that feature. Um, right now there's, there's a ton of code written with spread right now. Um, I personally feel comfortable leveraging it. In, in my code and, and then transpiling down to ES5. And should the, they decide to not ratify it in 2016, um, Babel will probably hopefully still support it and we will be able to then migrate to something else like object apply, which would, would be the, the call it native way of doing it. Or we would define some sort of polyfill that would drop in until we can migrate away from it. But it's a really good question because we, it, is, it is essentially like using edge code and there is a risk involved with it. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's so yeah, in the browser, um, it's been, it's been all right. I won't say it's been flawless. Um, source maps always take a little bit of extra time to generate. So when you're, when you make a change, the system that's actually building those source maps will, uh, if it's doing incremental builds, we'll be, pick that up fairly quick and, and be able to deliver it. But sometimes 
we found that uh, when you set a breakpoint, for instance, you may you may sometimes have a bug where it's difficult to get a breakpoint that hits exactly where you want to start debugging because uh, the minified or concatenated, or sorry, the minified and uh, and uh, mangled code that we're outputting ends up being um, reorganizing things in a way that that makes hitting that exact breakpoint difficult. But we can still step over and we can usually get a get a gist of it. That being said, um, we have both when we're when we're testing, we have you know a flag that we'll set that will turn off both our mangling and our uh, minification. So we're able to to just test the transpiled uh, ES6 code. And that we find has been pretty fairly painless. It's it's not as painless as directly using that ES 2015 code in your browser uh, because you are again using a source map. So, um, but it's the gain. I would say the gains that we're getting by using ES 2015 outweigh the the small pain points that we're running into around setting breakpoints and sometimes not getting to the exact point that we want or being able to set a point on the exact line that we want. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, six code. Yes, you do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. So the source map actually map in your browser will show you the ES6 code that you've written. So you will see that, and you can go in, and you can set breakpoints within the ES6 code. And when your, your transpiled ES5 code runs and hits that particular breakpoint, it will actually stop. And you're able to step through your code in the ES6, um, which then maps to the ES5 that's actually running in your browser. So it works out. It works out. In I would say 99% of the cases works out really well. There are some cases though where finding that like hitting that exact breakpoint that you want can can sometimes be uh, problematic. Mostly when you're uh, mangling your code with something like Uglify or when you have um, you're minifying it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Safari, Chrome, um, Windows Edge. They all support source maps now, uh, both for uh, CSS and for um, JavaScript. Yep. I used the image loader with Webpack, and I really liked how easy that made it to hash, put hashes in the names of my image files, so I could hash them for a long time. Mm -hmm. Right. So I haven't gone down that road quite yet. Um, all of my image processing is still happening in Gulp. So we have a big Gulp uh, workflow for most of our app. And we've taken approach of like, if it's not broken, let's not try and fix it too much. Um, so Webpack is bundling a lot, a lot of our JavaScript files and uh, starting to bring in some CSS now. But we haven't gone down the road of... Uh, bringing the, the images in and then having them hashed and, uh, and using the loaders for that. So I don't have a good answer for that question, actually. Um, but it's something, it's something to, to actually to, that I would be interested in looking, at, looking into because eventually I'm hoping we can migrate more and more of our, of our tooling, uh, of our build tool chain in that direction. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Just on this topic, you did use a CSS loader? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what happens is we're actually using uh, ES twenty fifteen template strings. So, we're, what what you do is you when you import when you import the CSS, you have a couple of options. One is to just raw import it, and it's going to drop it in as is. So, it's not going to do any prefixing or anything like that. Uh, the other option, though, is you can assign it to a variable, and then I can call class names within that object. It basically maps the strings to an object that you get at the other side. And that, what we're doing for a lot of our, uh, our modules now, um, is we can inject that into the template string itself. So um, for, for Angular, as long as we're using directives heavily, which we are, uh, we can leverage those ES 2015 template strings to inject the, um, the call it localized version of that CSS rule um, directly into the template. Yeah. 
there was a question over here. Yep. Uh, for like huge projects where there's a lot of dependencies, mm -hmm. um, if you bundle them all into one file, you're looking at you know, billions. Yep. Um, is there a way to like set a file limit size with your webpack and like have a series of files? That yeah, yeah. So great question. Um, so if you have a big project, let's say you have like a mega JavaScript, um, and you don't want to send that all to your client because maybe. 100K of that is all that's really needed for 95% of your users. And you have this all this other extra stuff that may get loaded for admin, may get loaded for whatever reason, and you don't want to send that down. Uh, Webpack lets you, just like require JS, um, tell your bundle where it should split. So Webpack supports this notion of being able to split your split your packages into different, different files. And you basically can say, at this point, um, split my file and then within your application, when you get to that point, you can then asynchronously load the next, the next bundle the same way that you would do with require, for instance. So um, it's not going to automatically do it, you, you, and you probably don't want it to automatically do it. Uh, you probably would, would like to have some control over when you're dynamically pulling in that next bit based on where the user ends up in your application. I'm here and if they are get to this point they're probably an admin so i should probably pre start prefetching you know the admin uh bundle for instance but all of that can live as a one application series of imports um, but you can tell webpack where to make those splits very cleanly So no, this so you would still need to go through the same steps that you would if you were to dynamically load in a bunch of extra services or a bunch of extra content uh, in another bundle. They still need to get registered. Um, so this is where we start to diverge from an Angular specific uh, or an Angular one specific implementation, um, and then getting getting into Webpack as what Webpack can do as a tool. Um, you're still going to face all of the same issues that you do in in Angular One. Now there, now um, we aren't splitting our our packs in that way right now. Um, it is something that we want to move towards doing more of. But for instance, the, the issue that you're talking about is I need to register all these services, and it happens when I define when I when I load Angular. I'm still going to have to go to go through the same workarounds that I would normally have to to bring in that additional content and load it and, and require it at, uh, at either load time or when I'm further down my app. Uh, yep. Uh, okay. um, so are you using Angular um, still? Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, so we're taking, we're, we're taking a, like a, a little step-by-step -step approach to, um, to the modularization uh, we still rely heavily on their D DI. Uh, we haven't got to the point where we are now requiring other services and then importing them and then using them directly. That's not something that we're doing right now. Um, it's something that I'm actually interested in, in looking at more uh, as a potential solution to, again, um, so that we don't really have two module systems really running at the same time, uh, Angular's DI and then ES2015's modules. Um, but yeah, we're, it's not something that we're doing actively right now. Um, there's a question right here. Yeah, you showed an example earlier with the CSS. Yep. Importing scripts right in the beginning. Yep. Um, I assume that there is, there's ways to uh, tell Webpack that you intend, if you had a situation where you wanted one to override the other. Very much so. Um, so if we're looking at this slide here, we've got a color one imported from color one.scss and color two imported from color two.scss. Um, if I just do a straight import, it's going to bring those files in verbatim. Um, so then the cascade would be in full effect. But if I am assigning them to a variable, then it will, it knows that I really actually am looking at localizing this uh, and I want to use a localized version. So you can mix and match. Um, so I'm, I may have an application, a good example was I may have an application where I'm importing uh, all of Bootstrap CSS, for instance. Uh, and I don't want it, that to be localized all over the place. And I also don't want to be importing it in all these different files. I want to do it once at the top of my application and then be able to use those CSS rules. Um, I can still do that. I would basically import Bootstrap from you know Bootstrap and uh, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't specify a, a specific variable for it, and it would still get delivered and, and rendered into into the uh, CSS that gets sent out. So, anything else? Yeah. Oh. Um, not heavily, no. Uh, and the main, the main reason was that we had a, we were using a lot of examples that followed Webpack. We had a lot of support. We, and we had some internal experience with it already. So it was a tool that we were familiar with. This is a question of the devil, you know, uh, mainly for us. Um, I don't have enough knowledge of, uh, of, uh, NS, what, what, JSPM, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I don't have enough knowledge of JSPM to really make a comparative analysis of which one is, uh, what are the advantages and, and disadvantages of the two uh, module systems. Yeah. Or, yeah. Cool. All right, well, um, unless there aren't any more questions, uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around afterwards to, to chat um, and hope you all Got something out of the talk.